Carolina This Week with Tim McGinnis. Good morning. We've been covering the 7th Congressional District race since the district was created last year. On Tuesday, voters went and voted in the primary for the Democrat and Republican nominees to serve that first ever district of the 7th Congressional District. The Republicans are going to a runoff between Andre Bauer and Tom Rice. We're going to have a debate Friday night at 8 o'clock between those two in the Democratic race. Well, Gloria Bromel Tinubu appears to have won, but it's being contested in a lawsuit from filed by two voters. And Gloria Bromel Tinubu joins us right now. We're taping this on a Friday <laughs> afternoon. I want to be I want to be honest with everybody. So yeah. or on a Thursday afternoon. We don't know where this is going to go. Tomorrow the vote should be certified. Yes. How do you feel about it being contested right now? Well, Tim, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about the election. I want to first of all say uh, thank you to the many voters of the 7th District who came out in really record numbers in some places to let their voices be heard. Um, we've seen democratic engagement at its best, and I'm always um, supportive of, of any efforts to, um, for anyone to practice their, you know, their right to, to, to engage in the democratic process, whether that's filing a lawsuit or anything else. So I, I'm just excited that we have been um, selected by the, uh, or endorsed by the voters of this district and that those uh, votes will be um, confirmed tomorrow when the, the elections committee meets to uh, ratify that vote. What's at issue here is Ted Vick yes. and votes that went to him, though he dropped out of the race yes. last month, mm -hmm. about a little over 2,000, maybe around 2,500 yeah. votes. About 23 or so. Should those votes have been counted? A lot of people are saying every vote counts. Why don't these votes count? And that yeah. would shift the percentages to where you would have just below the 50% of the vote needed to win outright. Yeah. Well, the precedence has already been made, and the, the law is very clear that a candidate, um, you know, someone who's actually a candidate in the race, that their votes would be counted. Um, Mr. Vick uh, resigned, um, re you know, re gave up his candidacy uh, last uh, month in, in May and withdrew from the race. So he was not a candidate. So only the votes of the candidates would be counted. And um, I believe the election committee did the right thing, as they have done in the past, by not counting its votes, and which means that we are indeed the winners of that um, Democratic nomination. Well, let's move along. As of right now, you mm -hmm. are the presumptive one winner of the yes. primary vote. If things change and Preston Britton becomes a, a, a candidate again in this race, I will invite him on this show and give him equal time. Let's move along yes. and talk about some of the issues. Yes, I'm We've excited. talked about issues broadly, I think, mm -hmm. mostly, and I want to get a little bit more honed in on things mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start off with I-73 since it's such a big, a big issue for the 7th District. You really aren't in support of it. Well, the big issue for the 7th District is employment. That's the big issue. <laughs> the and big some issue people for say the that I-73 will mean jobs if it's built. It, um, w when and if it's built. Um, but we have more immediate issues. Um, we're talking about right now we have people who are seriously underprivileged and in poverty. Seven out of the eight counties are persistently poor. Uh, we have tremendously high unemployment. We have issues in terms of our public education system. We have issues in terms of health care, affordable health care. And so the issue for me is really to take the message of full employment for all to Washington, D.C. It it's been a long time since this country has even engaged in that conversation about providing full employment for people who are willing and able to work. So for me, that's the issue. Um, we have to get people working for jobs at livable wages to give them that security. And what we've seen over the last 30, 40 years is a steady decline in wages, a st steady decline in, in opportunity for people. And so we, we have to, that's the main issue. Specifically, what would you do in Washington to bring those, to bring good wage jobs right. for right. the people here? Right. Well, first of all, the, the, the country has to be committed to full employment. And, and unless we put the conversation back to that, we're not going to be able to do anything. And I think that that's something that we can all agree on, whether we're from 
the South um, or from the Midwest or from the, the Northeast. I think we are seriously challenged by the unemployment that we've seen, much of it as a result of the global economy that we operate in, but also the Im impact of technology. We saw what happened in agriculture when technology uh, was introduced. We've seen it in manufacturing. We've seen it now in the service industry, when we're talking about even the banking and financial industry, where tellers have been replaced by ATM machines. So the nature of the global economy is such that we have to really, and the technology-driven economy, we have to focus on where can we create jobs for people. And so we have to look at not only the private sector, the sector that we've traditionally looked at, um, and the private for, which is the private for-profit sector, uh, we have to also look at the private nonprofit sector. We also have to look at the public sector as a way of meeting that uh, unmet demand that is being ex experienced in our global economy. So yeah, we need to focus right away. And one of the immediate things that we can do is to allocate resources for the improvement of our infrastructure. Uh, we have bridges and roads and highways that are not um, well kept. Um, and so we can go and improve existing ones like 501 and 701, um, s Highway 17, um, particularly 701, the one that's between here and Georgetown, my home county, hasn't been improved in decades. But these are, those are state roads. But where will the they federal rely, money? They rely on federal funds. I mean, mm -hmm. states get a, a, a large proportion of the monies that the federal government spends is in transferring uh, those dollars to state and local governments. And so the notion that uh, the government is just up there spending money like, you know, a drunken sailor or something is really a misguided notion. Uh, a large percentage of those funds that are collected by the federal government are really being dispersed to state and local government to pay teachers, to pay public safety officials, to pay for transportation. That's how the system works. But the, the rhetoric prevents us from really engaging in those kinds of meaningful conversations. And so to, the to, so to the extent that we can get a money immediately uh -huh. to uh, expand or create uh, this, this new interstate, uh, and if we can make sure that those jobs really benefit the local economy, I am all for it. What else would you do for, are you, I guess it comes down to a lot of people talk about being pro-business versus being pro just the, the person, the worker. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that? Who, do you want to help the business or do you want to help the person or do you want to help both and how, how can you yeah. can you do both? It's not an either or proposition mm -hmm. and I think um, too much of the conversation has been this group against that group. Um, in economics we talk about the circular flow, right? How households depend on businesses and businesses depend on household and that flow of dollars and resources have to continue. When that cycle is broken is when we have a challenge. And what we've seen is, uh, we've seen record profits um, over these last few years, even under the most difficult challenges that we've faced in terms of the recession. Um, and we've seen this, these record profits, but these profits have not been reinvested back into the economy, creating jobs, um, expanding opportunity for more people. So there's this gap that has to be filled. And so, if the private sector isn't filling it, filling it, and we know that it needs to be filled, then the only thing that's left is the public sector. Um, and so what, what, we see, what we've seen, though, is not only this decline in private sector jobs, we've seen people trying to reduce the number of public sector jobs, which is only adding to the problem of us being able to recover from this recession. So there has to be a really fundamental conversation about macroeconomics 101 <laughs> <laughs> and how you know fiscal policy and monetary policy can work to bridge that gap when the private sector isn't reinvesting those dollars back in to the economy and, and, and again I'm not blaming them because they operate on a global platform. When you talk about the recession I think everybody can agree the recession started because banks were getting into some really risky exactly. ventures. But my question is about regulation. So, you know, the, the Republican side will say, we're over-regulated, there's too much regulation. The Democrats will say, there's not enough regulation, there needs to be more regulation. Is there a balance between the two? Does there need to be more regulation? What kind of regulation should there be? Or is the government overreaching? Well, at the heart of the financial crisis 
was the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, which prevented banks from doing the very risky investments that we saw. Um, they were, prior to the repeal of that act, they were not allowed to um, mix investment banking and all of these kinds of risky kinds of undertaking with regular um, banking activities. With the repeal of Glass-Steagall, it opened the floodgates. And it, it really um, started back, you know, when we had the savings and loan debacle with Enron, again, because of deregulation. So I think that there has to be a healthy balance. We have to protect um, the citizens of this country and of this region. And at the same time, we have to make sure that regulations are designed to encourage and promote um, entrepreneurial activities. But I think the biggest challenge that we face is that the small businesses, you know, those businesses that generate or create 20 or less um, and, uh, j workers and, and we have a lot of those along and, the and, Grand Strand. And, and in fact, they are the, in the majority. Much of the public policy that we see and, and the, much of the regulation talk doesn't even include them. And I think that the, the biggest challenge for us is to really focus on those small businesses, which are in the majority. 98% um, of businesses generate less than a million in revenues. So when we talk about business and people tend to lump them all into one big category and say the business community, but I think that's a mistake because on the one end you've got a very few who dominate the industry. You've got a handful of industries, uh, businesses in, in banking, for example, a handful in almost all of the major industries that dominate. They're not the ones that are having the problem. And I believe that's what the, the, the president was referring to when he made that remark, that those huge businesses, those people who operate as really almost monopolists or within a monopolistically competitive environment, they aren't the ones who are, who are challenged. It's the small business that's operating within a competitive environment that are even being dominated by the large ones in terms of you know, having access to the supply chain and depending on them that are really struggling. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we have a lot more to talk about. I want to talk about some foreign policy Certainly. and health care. Certainly. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Gloria Bramel Tinubu. Tinubu. Yes. That's a, that's a big controversy about saying saying your name in the newsroom. Not controversy, <laughs> but topic of discussion. Everybody comes to me. How do you say it? Is it just Tinubu. Say, just say Gloria. Gloria. I'm good. I'm good <laughs> Gloria. with that. Gloria. <laughs> okay. Well, Gloria, uh, I want to talk about health care. Yes. South Carolina, one of the many states suing the federal government over the mandatory part of the the, the mandatory inclusion mm -hmm. part of the of the plan of President Barack Obama's plan. How do, you, how do you feel about health care? How, how do you feel about what's called Obamacare? Well, it's the Affordable Care Act, and I am in complete su support of it and will support the President's efforts to keep it in place. Again, we are in a, a part of the country where many of the residents are challenged, um, not only by poverty, but by health uh, risk in terms of heart attacks, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, low birth rate for babies, uh, you name it. Um, we are challenged. And um, it's important for people to have access to affordable health care for a number of reasons. If we're going to be competitive as a country, we need to have productive workers. Workers cannot be productive if they're not healthy. I mean, it's a simple kind of equation. Was and so those, some of us have been, have been born into privilege and some people have not. Been. And it's the kind of thing that it's just a toss of the, the dice, right? And you just happen to be born into what family you're in. But it's important for people to have equal access to just basic care for themselves. I think a and lot, it's, and it's the cost has just gotten out of the roof, gone out of the roof. I think a lot of people would say, though, that the president's plan goes too far, requiring the individual mandate and require various requirements within the plan that put a burden on doctors or put a burden on the drug makers. Yeah. Are there parts of the plan that you would change or do you think it, it goes maybe not even far enough? Well, I, I think we have a good model that's been in place for about 18 years now and that's the Switzerland model where they have pretty much the same elements that this plan has, um, where everyone has to participate. And the reason why that is crucial um, if, if you know um, uh, anything about uh, cooperatives, the way that they work, and this is similar to this, is that when people pool in collectively, 
it reduce, reduces the cost for, of everyone. So it makes it more affordable. If people get to opt out, then you're talking about people fending for themselves, and so people who have resources and the ability to purchase their health care from wherever get to do that, and people who don't, don't. So the idea is to make it affordable to people who, because of no fault of their own, happen to be born into poverty, happen to be born into a middle or working class family, and just cannot afford uh, what it takes to, to be healthy. So I, I think it's something that can work and is working. The model is working in other parts of the world. And I think it's the same kind of thing we do when we talk about national defense. Can you imagine each of us having our own little military, you know, defending our property? We, we've, we've decided that pu public safety is one of those public goods that it's best provided through a collective mechanism. And healthcare is another one of those because of the nature of the, the service. And I suppose we'll find out what the Supreme Court has to say all about all of that here in a few weeks. So our next congressman or congresswoman. Congresswoman. Could, <laughs> could be up there fighting over a new health care plan if this one gets thrown out. So I think it's a big issue that uh, is everybody's going to be keeping an eye on moving forward. Yes. Let's talk about, you brought up defense, let's talk about foreign policy mm -hmm. for a minute. We see what's happening in Syria. We saw what happened in Libya. Mm -hmm. Should we be involved in Syria right now? Should we be getting getting boots on the ground, so to speak, in Syria? I'm in, all, I'm, I'm in support of this country defending its national interests wherever they happen to be in the world. I'm definitely in support of that. I think that we have to have a strong, uh, efficient defense that's um, adequately funded and where our, our young men and women who are putting their lives on the line are equipped to um, do the very best that they can to protect themselves as well as serve this country. They deserve that. So let me say that first. So I'm, I'm, I'm in support of our military. But I'm also um, mindful of the fact that we are not an island and that in order for us to provide the appropriate kind of leadership, we have to have conversations with the rest of the world and have a conversation with our friends and even folks who may not necessarily be our friends about how we handle issues such as the ones that we've seen uh, in the Middle East. So uh, I really believe in engaging the international community. I believe in the uh, efforts by the United Nations. I believe in the work that, for example, Kofi Annan is doing right now in terms of his six-point plan to, to, to sort of help address the issue in Sy issues in Syria. So I believe that we should be strong, have a strong defense, be ready to protect our nat national interests as well as our allies, but we also have to understand that we're also a part of a bigger, broader international community, and it's in our, it's our, in our best interest if we engage them as well. If you were elected, you'll be one of hundreds of people who are going to be up in Washington with a say in what gets cut, what gets money, looking at reducing the tri multi-trillion dollar deficit we have, I think both sides will agree that there needs to be some combination of both maybe some kind of tax structure change as well as cuts to different departments. Would you cut military? We certainly would, I would certainly look at that um, because we have to sort of, as I said, we have to be efficient and we have to make sure that we're allocating resources in such a way that it is enabling us to realize all of our objectives. Our defense is a major objective, but also providing for, you know, when we talk about the preamble to the Constitution is the general welfare and as well, in, in, in addition to the common defense. Um, and so, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So there are a number of things on that whole list that we have to be mindful of, defense being one of them. And we also have to, in my mind, separate our general annual expenditures from our capital expenditures, things that we're investing in over the long run, over the longer term. And we're, we're not doing that now. So most industrialized countries do that. We have to, first of all, do that so that we are comparing apples to orange, apples to apples and oranges to oranges. All right, we gotta sell some apples real quick. We'll be right back. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Welcome back, Gloria Bramel Tanubu, candidate, or I guess, Right now, <laughs> we're taping on a Thursday. We assume that you're going to be the only Democratic candidate for the 7th Congressional District race. Yeah. But yeah. as we've learned in South Carolina politics, <laughs> anything can change, and it probably will. <laughs> well, well, maybe not this <laughs> We'll see. 
in the short time we have left, I just want you to make your best case in a couple minutes why I should vote for you. Uh, why you should vote for me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that the voters have already spoken, and, and we um, won very convincingly. And I, I'm honored, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the residents for connecting with our message of uh, jobs and full employment for all and um, a, a, a fully funded, fully functioning public system uh, of education as well as affordable health care and you know, focusing on our infrastructure. Um, this is a rural district. We have to focus on the rural communities, the people who have been um, isolated and neglected over the years because we've seen poverty continue to grow throughout the district. I'm e excited about working with them. My background as an applied economist as well as an agricultural economist uniquely prepares me to serve this district, and I'm honored that they have selected me to do that. When I say vote for you, I mean in November. And oh, yeah. Talking about... Th that's the answer is the same. Talking, <laughs> but, but ta and talking about November, you're going to be running against a Republican, obviously. Yes. We don't know who that Republican's going to be yet. I'll mm -hmm. plug the debate that we're going to have on Friday if you haven't made up your mind if you're going to vote in that uh, primary runoff. Uh, you can find out. But uh, what I want to know is how are you going to convince the majority of people in Horry County who are conservative to vote for a Democrat? Well, you know, I think that people tend to be um, conservative about some things and liberal about other things. And I think that I will be able to appeal to folks who are in that category. And I think that people are ready for unity around a common cause. And for me, that common cause is really full employment and um, creating opportunity for everyone and to make sure that we have, our children have uh, a bright future and a possibility to move up the economic ladder and realize the American dream as I was able to, um, being born to parents who only had an elementary school education. I was given that opportunity through a support system and public schools were a great part of that from my high school to through my master's and PhD. So. I know we're out of town. Thank you all. That's going to do it. Thank <laughs> you, Ms. Tinubu, and we will see you back here on the show one day. I Thank you, Ted. Okay. We will be right back.